I'm grateful you're watching and listening to this message. I hope that through what you hear, you really grow to understand what God says and how much he has shown his love for you in Jesus. As God's word is open, I pray that he speaks to you. And listen, if it would be helpful for you to talk to someone, please reach out. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Again, thank you for watching. If you have your Bibles, could you take them and turn to Exodus? Exodus chapter 17. I want to begin by asking a couple questions. So one of those questions is, are, are you open to God working in your life? Are you open to that? I would assume the answer is yes, but again, a lot of different people in the room from a lot of different backgrounds. Are you open that he might be working in your life? And a question well, then how, how does God work in your life? It's the next question. How, how does he work? How do you see him at work in your life? Does he work in big, powerful, extraordinary, lightning bolt ways? Is that the way he works? So powerful, so strong, you just never could chalk it up to coincidence. Bigger forces are at play. Is that the way, is that the way you see God regularly at work in your life? Or is God's work in the routine, the commonplace, the everyday, the, the ordinary? Does God work in ordinary ways where there aren't fireworks, but you still see some things and you trace his goodness through some things? Others might chalk it up to just common to life, but you actually see God's hand in it. Today, I want you to see actually that God works in both ways. God works in the extraordinary, and God is at work in the ordinary. By this point in Exodus, so here's where we are, just a, a little update here. If you haven't been with us, we've been going through the book of Exodus. Before Christmas, we went through a good portion of it. Uh, in January, we have looked as God's people have moved on from the Red Sea, and now they are entering into a wilderness they don't know what awaits them, but God is faithfully leading them and directing them. They're beginning to sort through what is it going to look like to walk with God. And so today I want us to read a couple different places, but one of those is going to be in Exodus chapter 17. And we're going to begin reading in verse 8, all right? Exodus 17 and verse 8. If you don't have a Bible, uh, there's probably one in front of you, but there's also on the screens as well. Hear God's word. It says, At Rephidim, Amalek came and fought against Israel. And so Moses said to Joshua, Select some men for us and go fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the hilltop with God's staff in my hand. And Joseph did as Moses had told him and fought against Amalek. While Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And while Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. But whenever he put his hand down, Amalek prevailed. When Moses' hands grew weary, grew heavy, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat down on it. Then Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other so that his hands remained steady until the sun went down. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his army with the sword. The Lord then said to Moses, write this down on a scroll as a reminder and recite it to Joshua. I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven. And Moses built an altar and named it, the Lord is my banner. He said, indeed, my hand is lifted up toward the Lord's throne. And the Lord will be at war with Amalek from generation to generation. What you find in Exodus 17 is God in the extraordinary. God at work in the extraordinary. We heard the text read uh, a moment ago. But it might be helpful to focus on like a couple of those words, right? We should notice, we should notice the word rod or staff that Moses had, this stick. Remember, 
what we find here, when I say it's God in the extraordinary, it's Moses has this stick, he has a staff, this rod in his hand. This battle will not be about military might. This battle will not be about like strategic military plans. Notice there's the army that's mentioned is barely trained. They're not ready for war. Go out and pick some people, Moses tells Joshua. And Joshua goes and picks some people. We don't see a lot of training. What we see is something of God coming through. The staff is raised just as like that rod was raised over the, remember, over the Red Sea. Remember that rod went into Egypt and did battle in Moses' hand with Pharaoh. God comes through. There's this big moment where, again, something, I mean, even I think somewhat mysterious of like as Moses' hands are raised, I think even as the rod is raised, Israelites win. It's an extraordinary moment. And I would ask you just by way of trying to live in this text, are there moments when it was clear to you, big ways, big moments where God came through? I wonder if you trace your story back. Or are there big stories? Are there moments where you were headed one direction, but God interrupted in some significant ways, drawing you to himself? Are there places where God, in a big way, met you in pain, met you in life being a disaster as you were picking up the pieces? Do you know God moving in an extraordinary way, pursuing you, maybe even wrecking your plans, but doing so in love? Do you have some of those things? Interesting, I mean, I don't think the power was in that rod. The battle belonged to the Lord. But there is something about having these even just tangible reminders. If you go to my office or you go to my house, you'll see these little reminders, these little pictures or trinkets, and I don't worship them. But there's little reminders all along the way, and I think they're important for us as human beings where we have these little things that they actually cause us to look back. But in looking back, we, all, we actually it builds our faith for looking forward. We have this, this picture or this memento or this trinket or this something that we say that's very important to us that we go, you know, God met me there and I want to be reminded I never want to forget how God moved in an extraordinary way. Sometimes when, when we were not looking for him, he tracked us down. So we have the rod and we have the staff, but we also, I want us in this story to not miss God in the extraordinary. I, I don't want you to miss Joshua here. As you read through the book of Exodus, I mean, we've, we've been in this several weeks, so we may forget, like, this is actually the first time Joshua's name is mentioned. Do you realize that? The first time Joshua is introduced to us, and, and often how a character is introduced in the Bible is significant. And so this character is introduced, Joshua is introduced as the fighting the enemies of God, the, the commander in the battle. And we're going to come back to Joshua again, even in the book of Exodus, because he ends up playing this very prominent role in the story of God. You know what the name Joshua means? It means, it means the Lord saves. I mean, so Joshua on this extraordinary day when God's people are attacked, Joshua, how appropriate, isn't it, that the Lord saves, goes into battle, leads God's people into battle. As a matter of fact, I think you begin to trace history and lots of young Israelite boys are named Joshua in Hebrew, Yeshua. A lot of boys are named that. As a matter of fact, you know of a very significant Hebrew boy that was named Yeshua. Another one who came with power to save, to deliver God's people, to bring them to the ultimate promised land because Yeshua is translated over into English. We know the name Jesus. How interesting, no coincidence, huh? That this one who shows God's work in an extraordinary way, Joshua, that a thousand years later, another one comes and Joseph is told in Matthew 121, you call his name Yeshua, you call his name Joshua, you call his name Jesus, for he will save his people. He will save his people from their sins. 
Just a reminder, here we are in, and you just, don't you see this, how the Old Testament and the New Testament are so connected? Sometimes we think they tell a couple different stories. There's just one big story. What we find is Yeshua, Jesus, willing to fight for us, willing to make sure our enemies don't win. I, I love the picture of the Lord as our banner. Do you, did you read that? It's Yahweh Nisi. The, the Lord is our banner. The Lord is our standard. And you lift that up. And it's an amazing picture. And I think even in this story in Exodus, I wonder if we could, we could see, some, see some pictures of our own here. Do we see Jesus fighting for us, going into battle? But then I also think, do you, do you recognize the picture of someone on a hill with hands outstretched? Outstretched this time, not because men are holding it up, but because nails are holding it to a piece of wood. And we look to the cross and we say, the Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. Jesus is both the one who fights for us and secures the victory and the one who stands as our banner he cries, doesn't he, as he hangs? It is finished, and that's not a cry of defeat, but it's one of victory. He conquers, and, and that victory is validated three days later when he rises from the dead. I want you to know the Lord is fighting for us. He fought for us even. Jesus fought for us on the cross where he says, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. It's an act of mercy because we're sick and we're rebels and we don't have anything to trot out to earn the Lord's victory, but we're given into it. It's a beautiful invitation, a reminder of the saving work of God. I hope you know it. I hope you know the Lord is my banner. I hope like that would be written over your life. The Lord is my banner. The Lord saves. I think we get glimpses in that, but we also need to, as we read through Exodus 17 and we read about this extraordinary work of the Lord, we also need to recognize something else. We need to talk about this whole idea of Amalek. This idea, we, we read, read words like in verse 14, a blot out the memory of Amalek. Or in verse 16, there's like this generational war with Amalek. So God in an extraordinary way defeats Amalek. Why, why does it seem so intense? Why, are the wording, why is the wording here? There are other nations where you don't read about them getting completely blotted out. Why Amalek? I want you to just, you don't have to turn there, but Deuteronomy 25, 17 may give us a glimpse into this a little bit more. This is a few years later, but Deuteronomy 25, we read these words, remember what the Amalek Amalekites did to you on the journey after you left Egypt. They met you along the way, and they attacked all your stragglers from behind when you were tired and weary. They did not fear God. And when the Lord your God gives you rest from all the enemies around you in the land, your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance. Blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven. Do not forget. This is interesting because it tells us, it gives us a little bit more commentary, doesn't it, on the exact situation. So here Amalek comes and the weak and the vulnerable, you think of maybe the, those who are aging, you think of maybe those that are trying to take care of kids, you think of the disabled, and it's like Amalek targeted them, targeted the people of God and tried to attack them. It gives you a different sort of idea of what's going on. This was vicious and it became a pattern What's interesting to, to you as you read through the rest of the Bible, this Amalek comes up again and again, attacking God's people. Comes up in times of Samuel and Saul. It comes up in times of David. It's interesting, even the story of Esther, which is like miles removed from this. Haman is a descendant of Agag, Agag who is an Amalekite. It's very, very interesting. It actually tells us something maybe going on more than just this being, it is a nation, it is a nation in the, in the Middle East there, but could there be more going on with this word, Amalek? Why so intense? I, I wonder if like Babylon, this is a term that describes people who oppose the mission and people of, of God. I wonder if it's a kind of a, yes, it's a nation, but it also reminds us there's something more going on. There's going to be an ongoing war against the people of God. 
I wonder if we can learn from this that there is a serious spiritual conflict. Sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we don't realize it. There's a war, a spiritual conflict. Have you read the Psalms and you read of all the, the lists of God's enemies? But not just the Psalms. I mean, we're reading through the Gospels in our Bible reading plan as a church. You read through Acts. You read through the Epistles. And you recognize, maybe even your experience tells you, we have a real spiritual enemy. We're not ignorant of that. And the story of Amalek can make us aware of that. Maybe it helps us appreciate. Have you ever felt like you are under attack? I'm not one of those kinds of people that finds the demon under every bush or everything, you know, it must have been the devil, it must have been the devil. I, I, don't, I don't see that every single place in my life. But there are seasons. Have you had those seasons where you feel especially targeted? Where it feels like your life is, like there's a, a spiritual force that is trying to undo all that God is doing. I talked to a friend the other day, and he was dealing with uh, one sickness after another and after another. And I think his interpretation of that is, I, I think we're dealing more, more than biology and germs here. It seems like this is the devil trying to, some sort of spiritual attack, trying to, trying to undo our faith. I wonder if, those, if there's maybe one or two or 10 or 20 in our church that felt the spiritual attack of uh, loneliness or maybe some doubt. It's begun to creep in. It begins to mess with you. I have friends that experience some significant anxiety. Sometimes you feel like your strength is gone and a spiritual enemy is hunting you down. I mean, you could chalk it up to, it just seems like random things have been happening Sometimes we see through that. I, I wonder if we can read in this story, maybe this could be a reminder that we are, until the Lord comes back and sets everything right, we are locked into a spiritual conflict, which is why I think there will be a generational war between the people of God and Amalek. It's like there's going to be this ongoing war, but maybe we need to be reminded today that even if we are in the season, or maybe we have friends that are being in, in, attacked, we feel like they're very vulnerable to an attack. The battle is the Lord's. Strongholds, strongholds will be broken. And then we think about the language here of the enemies of God being blotted out. I am so grateful for the good news that there is a huge collapse coming one day for Satan, for all demons, for all sin. There's a huge collapse and it will be remembered no more. And God will prove victorious. A day's coming. God's enemies will be defeated one day. So let's remember those, these things. Even as we, we read about a, a physical war, we can remember the spiritual conflict that we're locked into. Remember one day there's new heavens and new earth and the former things have passed away. As you keep reading in the story, so can we go over into chapter 18? And I just want to give some of the highlights here at the first part of chapter 18. It's a very, very somewhat surprising place. At the beginning of the chapter, you have a family reunion into Exodus 18. It's family reunion. Moses is reunited with his wife and with his children. They've been off the scene. They come back on the scene. And I actually, I want to tell you, I have more questions than answers. He he doesn't talk to his wife. He talks to his father-in-law. It, it just is a very interesting, interesting set of uh, things in the Bible. It does remind me, sometimes I have questions of the Bible that the Bible doesn't answer. There's some things like it's very interested in telling this part of the story, and I want to go, maybe that's what eternity is for. Like, I love to, what was going on here? And what about this? And how did she feel? How did he feel? All those sorts of things. Moses is reunited with his wife, his kids, his father-in-law. And we have a time of Moses conversing with his father-in-law, Jethro, about what the Lord has done. So you see that in Exodus 18, verse 8. So can you skip down there? It says, Moses recounted to his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to, the, done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardships that had confronted them on the way and how the Lord rescued them. And it says in verse 9 that Jethro, who happened to be a priest from Midian, it says he rejoiced over all the good things that the Lord had done for Israel when he rescued them from the power of the Egyptians. And this priest of Midian says, blessed be the Lord 
who rescued you from the power of Egypt, from the power of Pharaoh. He has rescued the people from under the power of Egypt. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because he did wonders when the Egyptians acted arrogantly against Israel. One thing as you read through the book of Exodus, it's not just that Israel would know there's a God, but actually that the nations would know that. And here we have Jethro, who's a Midianite, beginning to see what God is doing. Verse 12, they sit down and have, seems like some sort of sacred meal, Jethro and Aaron, and seems like the party's there. A lot of mystery, I'll confess. Moses has told him about God doing the extraordinary. Did Moses go back? I mean, it's almost like a full circle moment. Moses goes, he could tell him about the burning bush when he was in Midian before. He could talk about plagues in the Red Sea. God did the extraordinary things like making water drinkable, gave, giving manna on the ground, water from the rock, hands raised in victory. Like God did all these extraordinary things, but is God present in ordinary things? So we wanted to answer both of those. Is God present in the extraordinary? Yes. But is God present in the ordinary? Because we live in lots of ordinary things. We do live in these defining moments where God shakes up our world, but a lot of our life is lived with paying bills and taking medicine, running errands, and finishing homework and projects. A lot of our life is ordinary, household chores and hobbies, meals and aches and pains and minor family decisions and some major ones. A lot of life is lived in the ordinary, ordinary fears, ordinary dreams, ordinary things we do to escape, ordinary things we buy, what we drive, where we live. Does God work there? If you don't see, let me ask you, if you don't see fireworks, if you don't see God doing some amazing things that you could tell your friends and generations to come, is God at work? If you don't see that, I wonder if the next story could be really valuable for us to focus in on, not just God doing the extraordinary, but God doing the ordinary. Because look at Exodus 18. Can we look at verse 13? It says, the next day, it seems like just kind of an ordinary day, right? The next day, Moses sat down to judge the people, and they stood around Moses from morning until evening. You get this picture. I think the picture we're meant to have is like all these people are crowded around, crowded around Moses waiting for him to give a judgment. And maybe some of you love political science and civics, and you go like, well, what about the judicial system? Why don't they work it out? But there is no judicial system. They're just out of Egypt. They're former slaves about a month into this. And so we keep reading. Verse 14, when Moses' father-in-law saw everything he was doing for them, Jethro asked, what is this you're doing for the people? Why are you alone sitting as a judge while all the people stand around you from morning until evening? And Moses replied to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. Whenever they have a dispute, it comes to me, and I make a decision between one man and another, and I, I, I teach them God's statutes and laws. What you're doing is not good, Moses' father-in-law said to him. You will certainly wear out both yourself and these people who are with you because the task is just too heavy for you. You can't do it alone. Jethro is pretty observant here, right? For Moses, there could be burnout. For the people, there'd be this backlog of needs. If you've ever had to like wait on an, an appointment or wait on a court date to get set or wait on a disability, here, you know, any of kinds of these sorts of things, you know, if there's a backlog, it's going to be very, very frustrating to people eventually. And Jethro spots that. It's easy to point out problems, but Jethro has some advice. It seems like pretty ordinary advice, right? Verse 19, now listen to me. I will give you some advice, and God be with you. You be the one to present the people before God and bring their cases to him. But instruct them about statutes and laws and teach them the way to live and what they must do. But you should select from all the people, able men, God-fearing, trustworthy, hating dishonest prophet. You place them over the people as commander of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens, and they should judge the people at all times. Then they can bring you every major case, but judge every minor case themselves. And this way you will lighten your load and they will bear it with you. And if you do this and God so directs you, you will be able to endure. And all these people will be able to go home satisfied. Pretty ordinary advice. You could probably read it in lots of management books, there's like this prime representative, but Moses is going to function in that way. But 
He's going to give the regular instruction to God's people, but then things are delegated into manageable units. The span of care is better. Moses doesn't have to take it on himself. The people experience justice and they'll be satisfied. So what happened? Well, Moses executed the plan. Verse 24, Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. So Moses chose able men from all Israel and made them leaders over the people, commanders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They judged the people at all times. They would bring the hard cases to Moses, but they would judge every minor case themselves. Moses let his father-in-law go, and he journeyed to his own land. A couple things. One is how humble Moses is. He listens to the advice and sets in motion a different way of God's people to be governed. But I do want to pause for a moment. I do want you to notice what has happened here. In this midst of a book of fireworks, where God does extraordinary things, we actually have, did you notice we have a major administrative structure being put into place? For these, these are God's people, and we didn't necessarily have any direct word from God about it. We had no, we, we can't trace this directly toward, well, God told Jethro to tell it. We don't have that. There's nothing inherently spiritual about this. But I, I would ask you, would you say God is at work here? Is God showing his kindness to not let them go too long, to not let Moses or the people go too long? I mean, all this would, was headed for disaster. It would have broken down. And yet God worked, and, and sometimes theologians will call this common grace, common grace, where someone's given the definition here, common grace is the grace of God by which he gives people innumerable blessings that are not part of salvation. This isn't part of like the way, the truth, the life, the cross, the resurrection. This is just some ordinary wisdom that God gives to not just Christians, but to the world. God is just as in control. And God is just as much of a provider in bringing Jethro into the picture at just the right time as he was when, when he caused the plagues to come to Egypt. This is the same God. God is working in extraordinary ways, and God is working in ordinary ways. Do we see that? Do we see that God could be at work in a, a thousand common ways? I, I wonder if we do. I remember talking to a friend one time. It was before church, much like a church service we had this morning. And she had walked with the Lord for a long, long time. But she was beginning to doubt. Listen, she was beginning to doubt she was even a Christian because she didn't have these like high highs. She would hear about her friends talk about extraordinary experiences with the Lord, and she just didn't have all those. She knew, she knew who her Savior was. She knew Christ had died on the cross for her sins. But there just weren't a lot of fireworks. Even when she'd read the Bible, she would grow and try to be more like Christ. But she just lived an ordinary Christian life, and she began to wonder, is what I have real? Should I be doubting something? Because I hear others talk about like, God moving in these extraordinary ways. I think now, I wonder if the Jethro story would have helped her. Maybe it would be helpful to you to remember this. Like, I, I want you to be, like, I want all of us to be deeply spiritual people, deeply depending on God to act and work. But at the same time, could God be working could God be working in a conversation where you get advice, ordinary advice on how to raise your kids or how to take care of your aging parents? Could God be working in that, just an ordinary conversation? Could God be working in a new way to look at responsibilities? You're given a new task to do. And someone says, oh, I always try to do it this way. And then God, it's like something clicks and you're able to do your job very, very well. Could God be at work in that? Could God be at work in a new calendar or a new system? Our hope's not in systems and not in our calendar. But maybe you read a book, you listen to a podcast, someone gives advice, and you go like, oh, I ought to change some things, and you change some things. Is God at work in when you learn to prioritize what matters most? A doctor asks you about diet, sleep, exercise, just ordinary. But could God be at work in those questions? Does God work at work in professional development? Does God work through those kind of things? Proverbs 3, 6 talks about, in all your ways, acknowledge him. All of them. All your ways. Does that mean fireworks are going to come to all your ways? Or it could be there are a lot of different paths you're walking and you ask the Lord. You acknowledge. 
Much like Jethro does, he brings up God multiple times in this conversation. But at the end of the day, it's a very, very practical solution for Moses. Like, let's just divide this thing. Let's get an org chart that works and takes responsibility. You're, you're bearing too much. And it's a very practical solution. And I think we receive God's grace a lot in that way. By the way, it also should encourage, like, dozens of occupations and callings in this room. Several of you give your life to this kind of work. It feels very ordinary. Maybe the advice you give as a consultant or an administrator feels very ordinary. But it actually could be used by God in an extraordinary way. I think of our counselors and advisors. I think of those that are in the legal system. I think of mental health professionals. I think of wise friends and wise teachers and parents and managers who may not be extraordinary, but you just show up in ordinary ways and God works through that. You learn, you grow, you relieve burdens, you help people, you understand the world, you make changes, and some of those things seem pretty ordinary. But I thank God for what you do because it may be God is at work in those things. I, I read this, and I do want to ask, like, how open are we to receiving wisdom in this way? Do you seek it? Especially when it comes, like, okay, so it seems like Jethro takes God into, an, into account. When it comes from that, we ought to be rightly suspicious of just following the ways of the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. But maybe to help even safeguard us there, well, let's just keep taking in God's word on a regular basis and have our minds renewed, which gives us discernment to read, is this worldly wisdom or is this just like practical common grace wisdom that we could take? Maybe it would benefit us more and more to build friendships and have conversations, which could be God's grace of like, can I run something by you? I have this decision. I've got to make it work. Can I get your input on it? And again, maybe no fireworks, but someone says, here's a couple questions I would ask, and you go, those were the best questions, and it actually, it actually had a bearing on my, the rest of my life because I asked those very ordinary questions. Could it be that we regularly seek the Lord's help? I learned something. Or maybe I was just reminded of something this week as I prayed multiple times in this room with you. And that is, I've got to live a life of dependence and so regularly, there ought to be times where I trust in the Lord with all my heart. I remind myself, I, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. So many opportunities to see God at work in the ordinary. I do see God's hand in both. In the ordinary and in the extraordinary. What I've actually prayed is that God would meet every single person in this room. It's an extraordinary thing that God saves us, turns our lives around, gives us the first steps of faith when we had none. So I do want to ask you, do you know him? Do you know him in the big extraordinary moments of your life as well as in all the ordinary? Is that a relationship you have? Could this be the day? Could this be the day where you surrender to him? Not promise you'll do better, but say, Lord, I, I am yours. And what if today even began a day, began a life of a relationship and dependence? How open are you to God's work in your life? How open are you? A God who comes to rescue, a God who comes to save. Because this is what I know, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. Can we do that? Can we call on his name and see him come to our rescue again? Let me pray. Oh God, we pray to you as the one who does extraordinary things and the one who makes the earth turn at just the right orbit and radius and pace and speed and so many ordinary things. So, Lord, help us to see, help us develop eyes to see that. Give us wisdom and discretion. Lord, I pray that we would trust you with all of our heart, that we would not constantly rely on our own understanding, but we would acknowledge you in all of our ways, and you would, you would make our paths straight, that you would direct them. Pray that we would not be wise in our own eyes. 
but we would receive your grace. We pray for your help. We need it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.